mind of Christ my Savior live in me. What an awesome prayer. Amen. I was just thinking that. That, that would be just a great uh, thing to say to the Lord in the morning. Let me have your mind. May it live in me today. Thank you for your book. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see your smiling faces. <laughs> Thank you, smile. Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord for his faithfulness and keeping us this week so that we can just meet together again and uh, and just praise his name. You know, there's a song that says, If it had not been for the Lord on the Lord, my side, tell me where would I be? Where would I be? Yeah. I heard that this and I just I'm just singing and I thought, well, where would I be? Yeah. It's almost embarrassing to think about the stuff that could have happened, but it didn't happen. <laughs> the Lord was on my side. Yeah. And I thought about this, you know, I was thinking about the different things that we go through in life. Um, some friends of mine are going to Disneyland and, and they put on there, we're going to the happiest place on earth. I mean, it's, it's fun, especially when you take the grandkids, but, you know, in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. Yeah. And there's a difference, isn't it? Because yeah. happiness can change. But the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. That's where I am all the time. And Disneyland in ch charges you admission. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be happy. <laughs> And so you can get on rise and make you sick to your stomach. <laughs> but God offers admission to his kingdom for whosoever will. Yeah. And just put a joy in my heart to just think about that. And all I can say is, what a mighty God we serve. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. First of all, we give a heartfelt thank you for our Catholic group for donating this uh, wonderful bouquet of uh, this beautiful floral arrangement this morning. And uh, you know me, I always just want to thank all of those who give your time and efforts for all during the week and who decorate this altar and bring in refreshments and, and greet people. It's all done in the name of the Lord and it ushers in that glorious presence of God. Amen. And that makes it better than Disneyland. <laughs> they used to spend a lot of money there. Yeah. Praise the Lord. As Jesus says, whoever gives a cup of cold water in his name will be rewarded. Yeah. So he noticed even the smallest deed, every bulletin, every song, every note saying, he notices it all. Praise the Lord. So for announcement, this coming Saturday will be the Village's Medical Auxiliary, as we've been announcing this. Uh, and uh, if nothing else, you know, get the information for a friend or, or for yourself. And uh, it'll be good for uh, Village's Chapel to be represented. And obviously there's a table in the foyer to give you more information. And um, thank you for your gifts and praying for our pastor. Our pastor's Bill and I'm right. I was reading through and reminding of Moses when he held his hands up the, they were winning the battle and when he let his hands down they were losing so he had Moses and Aaron that's us to hold up our pastor in prayer this morning praise the Lord for the tag members who were not at the meeting Tuesday your red folder is on the table so you can pick that up and uh, proceed uh, likewise I ran across a, uh, a thing, maybe you've heard it before. It says, my grandmother always drank coffee from her saucer, probably because it was too hot. But one day she came across a poem that showed that there was a symbolism to this coffee ritual. It's called drinking from my saucer. I never made a fortune and it's probably too late now, but I don't worry about that much, I'm happy. And as I go along life's way, I'm reaping better than I sowed, for I'm drinking from my saucer because my cup has overflowed. I don't have a lot of riches, and sometimes the going gets tough, but I've got loved ones around me, and that makes me rich enough. I thank God for his blessings 
and his mercy he bestowed. I'm drinking from my saucer because my cup has overflowed. I remember the times when things went wrong. My faith wore somewhat thin, but all at once the dark clouds broke and the sun peeped through again. So God help me not to cry about the tough roads I've owed. I'm drinking from my saucer because my cup has overflowed. If God gives me strength and courage when the way grows steep and rough, I'll not ask for other blessings. I'm blessed enough. And may I never be too busy to help others bear their loads. Then I'll keep drinking from my saucer because my cup has overflowed. And I thought about what David, David must have felt this in Psalm 23 when he says, Thou preparest a table before me. You meet my needs and you sustain me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil and gives me spiritual blessings and the favor of God. And David said, when I thought of all this, I knew my cup runs over. In the South, they have an expression, God comes and puts a little extra jam on your bread. <laughs> And that just tells me we have an extravagant God. He is El Shaddai. Amen. Our God is more than enough. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Praise the Lord. So with that, let's stand and sing what makes this all possible. It is his amazing grace. Amen. That makes all things possible. Yeah.
John McGuire is going to sing one more selection. Thank you. This is near the top. second to second, and you sustain us in all that we do and in everything that happens in us. And so, Lord, for our appreciation, with a meager expression of thanksgiving, we just honor you and honor the work that goes on in this ministry and return these gifts, what you bless us with, and just give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Start wondering, the voice of woe bid me go, made me think 
was this the voice of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Yeah. And I thought, that sounds right. But then I looked up and I saw John 20. And I thought, well, wait a minute, John 20. So the former Catholic in me going to the Bible to look up what John 20 was, and going, New Testament, you are on the mark. Oh, yeah, John. Uh, John <laughs> in the Bible doesn't say Gethsemane. This is the resurrection, the garden of his tomb. That put a whole new spin on it. And, and Sherry also did some research, and she found that C. Austin Miles, the author, in 1912 had a vision, and he uh, woke up one day and clutched the Bible to his chest and saw Mary Magdalene with her hands on her chest and her throat in sadness walking through a garden. And this inspired him to write this piece all at once. He wrote the verses and then he wrote the music that same day and it all came out pretty much right as it is, as you see it. Uh, in your hymnals. So think about the words of uh, the last verse, and please feel free to sing along on the refrain because you all know what it is. The day that I needed a Kleenex, they're not here. 
Oh, thank you so much for that song. That was one of my favorite hymns when I gave my life to Jesus. I'm so glad to be saved and to get to know him. Thank you, darling. <laughs> See, it's a, it's a journey of getting to know him. We don't all of a sudden know Jesus. We get to know him as we go through life. It's a journey. We get to know him better as the journey goes, as God blesses us in all of our dealings. I'm so glad that he loves me. Mark may not love me. <laughs> you may not love me. But I am so glad that Jesus loves me and he understands me. He knows what works. And he knows what works for you. And he understands you. He understands the days that you get up and you don't want to do a thing. You don't want to answer the phone. You don't want to go outside. You just want to be. And that's okay. We need those moments. We need that time to ourselves and to the Lord. As we continue our series, The Irrefutable Evidence, Part 2, as you recall, when Thomas was given the news that Jesus had risen, he refused to believe the testimonies of reliable people. We're on this journey that Jesus took after he rose from the grave, 40 days of convincing evidence that he was alive. We're on this journey. At the end of our journey, we should be arriving on the day of Pentecost. He responded as an unbeliever and demanded that the evidence meet his conditions. Isn't that human nature? The evidence had to meet his conditions. He needed to see and to be sure of himself that Jesus indeed was alive. It wasn't as if Jesus had never said to his disciples that he would die and rise from the grave in three days. It was never that he did not have that conversation with them again and again and again. On several occasions, he told them of his death and resurrection. The first time he predicted his death is detailed in Matthew 1621, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised from the grave. And then there's a passage in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, 32, Luke 9, 21, 22, the second time in Matthew 17, 22, 23, Mark 9, 30, 32, and Luke 9, 
43 to 45. The third time, Matthew 20, 17 through 19, Mark 10, 32 through 34. Well, you get the picture. In all of the synoptic gospels, there is reference of Jesus having that conversation with them. He spoke to his disciples as they were heading up toward Jerusalem for Passover, and he told them how he would be mocked, scourged, crucified, and then rise again. And Thomas apparently didn't get the message. Apparently he didn't understand. He must have been listening but not hearing, or hearing and not listening, one or the other. Our scripture reference is found in John chapter 20, verses 26, 31. We'll go through verse by verse. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. The first time Jesus stood, in their midst as they were locked behind the doors because of fear of those who had said the disciples had stole the body of Christ and they were fearful. This verse doesn't reveal to us what Jesus had been doing since the last time he appeared at their gathering. He suddenly appeared behind locked doors. I'm convinced that Jesus was about encouraging his believers, his followers, that he was indeed alive. And those that were sick and afflicted, he healed them. He assured them that he was present. Wherever Jesus went, miracles followed. And people would gather seeking to be healed and to be delivered from something. It appears that they were still apprehensive after Jesus' first visit and said the exact same things. Peace be with you. And he breathed upon them for them to receive the Holy Spirit and that kind of settled them down and quieted their spirit. The disciples were meeting in a home that had a door which they had to unlock from the inside to enter. Once again, Jesus appeared in the same room with the disciples, even though the door was locked. You can't lock Jesus out. People try to lock Jesus out. They try to keep him from entering into their hearts. They find every excuse, every reason to not allow the Lord in the hearts, in their lives, in the doors of their hearts. And he's standing, knocking at the door of people's hearts. And they won't open the door. And if he came in, they would probably be frightened to death. They'd probably pass out and die. But Jesus wants them to know that he loves them and that he's with them. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my sight. See, because Thomas had said, he said to Thomas, and Thomas said that I won't believe unless I put my hand in his nail print holes in his hands and in his side. I won't believe. I will not believe. I will not receive the report of other people. I have to 
see this and experience this for myself. After Jesus breaks in on them, he began to offer the words, peace be unto you. Thomas was troubled. He was troubled. Whenever a person puts their hope and trust in another individual and that person fails to meet their expectations, it's hard for some individuals to regain the trust. You see, people follow Jesus for various reasons. People followed him for a free meal. They heard that he had fed 5,000 plus people. You want lunch? Follow me. You want to meet a guy that, that does miracles and that takes only a couple of fish and loaves and feeds everybody that's present? People followed him for various reasons. Not necessarily because they loved him, but what they could get out of being around him. Perhaps Thomas had been convinced that Jesus would establish his kingdom by his incomparable deeds. The things that they had witnessed, dead people, the death of Lazarus, the death of someone's child coming back to life, the blind seeing, the sick being healed, and those who were demon-possessed being delivered. All kinds of miracles that they were exposed to. Some people were fascinated just because of the miracles that Jesus did, not because they really loved them. But they were fascinated by what he was able to do. Now, Thomas was convinced that Jesus would be the one to carry them to the next level and take over the government in establishing his kingdom. Then Jesus suffered and died, which may have shattered his hope of ever being free of Rome's control. His concerns may have been more political than spiritual. You didn't see this coming, did you? Sometimes people's concerns are more political than they are spiritual. Maybe he was in that vein of thought that now we have Jesus, now He's going to take control. Now he's going to lead us out of this problem and out of this state of being. And Jesus died. Have you ever had shattered dreams before? Have you ever had shattered hopes before? You cast all of your hope in someone or in something and all of a sudden it's dashed. Sometimes people get bitter. Sometimes they'll just get hateful because of the disappointment that they've experienced in their lives. His concerns may have been political rather than spiritual. Jesus did not miss a beat in addressing Thomas. He came right in and said, here, take your hands and put them, take your hands and put them here and put them there. Because he knew his heart. He knew Thomas's heart, his concerns. And if you have concerns about the validity of Jesus Christ and you are sincere, he will make himself known to you. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Psalms 9, 
10 says, those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. If you seek him, you'll find him with your whole heart. He will manifest himself in ways that you will not be able to understand clearly. But he will reveal himself to you. Jesus knows a person's deep yearnings, and they may act out at a certain way around us by, but he knows how to reach that person with his redemptive love and grace. He knows how to reach him. They may act a certain way before us, but he knows how to reach them. Thomas acted a certain way before all of those who followed Jesus, but Jesus knew how to reach him. Because God is not willing that anyone, not a single person, not a single child, should be lost. He is not willing that any should be lost, but that all should come to know him. Verse 28, Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. When Thomas placed his hands in Jesus' wounds, he replied with a repentant and broken heart. My Lord and my God, for how many of us would only take a look to believe that this is Jesus. How many of us? They saw Jesus and believed. He had to put his fingers in the wounds to believe. What are you willing to go to what length are you willing to go to before you believe? You've heard the stories. You've heard many sermons. But yet your belief hasn't ushered you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 27. Jesus tells him, do not disbelieve. Believe. Believe. For many of us, we would just look and say, Lord, I know it's you, and believe. Jesus had handpicked his disciples, knowing fully well of each of their limits and brokenness. He even picked a betrayal. He picked Judas, and Judas betrayed him. He picked Judas. Judas was not my picking. <laughs> Judas was not your picking. Jesus picked him. And for three and a half years, he saw the works of Jesus Christ. He saw the love of Jesus Christ. He saw the grace of Jesus Christ. He saw the miraculous work of Jesus Christ, and he yet did not believe. See, because when you believe something, you commit yourself to it. Some of you believe in certain people, and you committed your life to be with them. Somebody has been with someone for 67 years. Hallelujah. The ups and downs, the ins and outs, and they're still there because they believed in each other. God believes in you, and he wants the very best for your lives. That's why he sent Jesus, because he knew your makeup. He knew that you would be incapable without the help and the grace of Jesus Christ in your life to being that fully person aware of God's presence in your life and in this world of woe. Verse 29, and Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? 
Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Has anyone in here seen my Jesus? <laughs> None of us perhaps have ever looked face to face to Jesus Christ. But we believe on the report of others who have experienced God's divine presence. We believe unto salvation. We believe the report. We didn't have to say, well, I'll just wait and see him when he comes back and then I'll believe. <laughs> Too late. Too late. They believe the report. Do you require a personal sign before you're willing to take the Lord at his word because of the failures of others who have let you down? You see, we can get cynical because of being let down by people, by the government, by relationships, by people on our jobs by people we entrusted, by investors that told us, oh, you're going to make a, a bunch of bucks. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and your hopes were dashed. Take the Lord at his word. Jesus declare a blessing, declares a blessing on all those who would come to faith in him without the help of visible manifestations. Well, Lord, I'll believe if you lift this paper up off this podium here. I'll believe you. I believe you because you are Lord and your word is life. I don't need special miracles. This blessing comes to all who believe based on the proclaimed gospel and the facts of its validity. Men wrote the Bible as they were moved by the Spirit of God. Believers living today are not deprived by not seeing Jesus physically. Instead, they are recipients of his special blessings. I'm blessed. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? Are you really blessed? Beyond measure. Can you count the many times that God has blessed you? Your brain isn't large enough to be able to keep up with the blessings that God has bestowed upon you. He's blessing you right now. Is the blood in your body being pumped? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Having the use of the faculty of our being. We're blessed beyond measure. This blessing comes to all who believe. Believers living today are recipients of his blessings Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus is speaking. With whom, having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. I kind of chuckled when I came across those last words. Joy inexpressible. Now, I've got a lot of golfers in here. Anybody golf? Anybody golf? Yeah. Now, I want to talk to you about joy inexpressible <laughs> for a moment. Joy inexpressible is like, well, first of all, Joy is like, out of all the years you've been practicing and working on your swing and your drive and your putting, one day, out of the blue, you hit a hole in one. Now, that's not joy inexpressible. That's not joy inexpressible. 
It's, it's a time to rejoice. It's time to be excited. But joy unexpressible is that you have two holes in one in the same day. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and you would never stop talking about it. People would get tired of you talking about it. And some of you would just weep and laugh and scream and weep and laugh and scream because it's joy inexpressible. There was a story that was revealed to me the other day. I don't know if you know the whinings. It's a singing group. And one of the brothers, Ronald, there's CC, BB, and so many other whinings, Marvin. He was ill. And his heart was only working 20%. I could identify with that. And he went to the hospital. And the doctor says, well, he's, he's not really going to make it because his heart is not functioning. And he said, I'm, I'm going to live. And the doctor said, well, you know, that's, that's good that you feel that way, but I don't think you're going to make it. And the father said, he's going to live. The father told him he's going to live. And so they went into, he went into the operating room, and they did a... Work, they worked on his heart, and they did all that they could do, and his heart would not work. They, they even said that it kind of blew up. Something happened. The doctors came to the family and said, uh, we've done all we can, but uh, he didn't make it. And the father said, he's going to live. And the three doctors came in, and they were Jewish doctors. He came in and says, I'm sorry, Mr. Winings, but uh, we, we couldn't revive him. And he says, we're going to make it. Could we, could we pray for you? And he anointed the three doctors. <laughs> and the family gathered around the three doctors. They were in a room, and they prayed. And they prayed, and they prayed, and then they released the doctors. The doctors went back to the operating room, and they had him ready to go to the morgue. And one of the doctors just took his hand and pressed, he doesn't know why he did it, but he pressed on the heart, and it started working. started working. You see, regardless of what the evidence declares to you, with God, all things are possible. And that family believed that anybody that didn't believe that he was going to live, they told them, well, just go out of the room. We're going to pray. And one of the things that he said to the doctors, that the father said to the doctors, he says, now, if he lives, you got to be at church Sunday. <laughs> Boy, they had a church service out of this world. And the glory of God was in that place. You see, we cannot count anybody out. Verse 30, thank you for that commercial break. <laughs> Verse 30, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. 
Today, many people ignore, deny, rationalize Jesus' miracles that are done in his name. People are still being healed, delivered, and in some places, the dead being raised. You may not be aware, but Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And he gave his disciples the power to heal the sick and to raise the dead. It's in Mark. Today, even in Jesus' name, some people attribute miracles to God while others attribute them to Satan. Matthew 12, 24, 25. Now when the Pharisees heard about it, Jesus delivered a man that was demon-possessed. And they had a problem with that. They said, this fellow, Jesus, does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or every house divided against itself will not stand. Jesus declared that. Verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Even though I die, I shall live again. Even though you die, you shall live again. Because of the miraculous work that Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. To ignore or deny or rationalize miracles in that day was impossible because the miracles were multiple and manifested before all who were present. You could not deny that if a person was laying by a well and came upon Jesus and Jesus healed him and he got up off of his sick bed and begin to walk and run and shout. You couldn't deny that. Undeniable. In fact, 35 known miracles were recorded in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In John, chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, gives a list of the miracles that Jesus had done. John selected seven for the special consideration that the people might come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah, and the Son of God. Your application. Jesus calls all who would follow him to live by faith in his word. Is there any truer word today than the words of Christ? Are there any truer stories that we can hold to our hearts than the story of Jesus Christ? There is no other person who can assure you of receiving eternal life. If there is, give them your heart mind, body, and soul if they can assure you of eternal life. There is none other. Amen. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. All roads do not lead to Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is the road that leads to eternal life into the eternal presence of God our Father. I am so happy that I am standing among believers who have possession of the same hope that I have. I am so glad that I am among the company of believers and family. We are all family. We're not cousins. We're not uncles and aunts. 
We're brothers and sisters. Members of a body that represents peculiar people. <laughs> Hello. They, talk, they, they seem like they're talking to themselves, but they're talking to the Lord. We represent a royal priesthood. We represent a holy nation, a people that have been called out of darkness and have been exposed to the light and glory of God our Father, that we may be placed here in all kinds of situations so that we can show forth the glory of God and God's presence in other people's lives. Father God, we're so grateful for your love. We're so grateful, Lord, that you take the weak things of this world and confound those mighty things. Father, thank you, Lord, for using each one of us to share the message of hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we bless you, we praise you, we exalt you, we magnify your name. Bless your people. And those who have reservations about whether or not they want to have a relationship with you, only you, Holy Spirit, can convince them that they need a Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us stand. I pray that decisions have been made here. I pray that God has spoken to your heart. And I pray that as you walk out, you walk out claiming the promise of Jesus Christ and his gift of eternal life to each and every one of you. God bless you, and may the Spirit of God be your inspiration and motivation to be that person that God can use to bring others into his kingdom. Amen.